Welcome to On the Line. I'm Christine Williams. Coming up for discussion on our Viewpoints panel. Youth behavior is getting worse, according to a major study. Later on, we'll be looking at tips to overcoming the winter blues. Stay tuned. And these are the issues we'll be presenting today to our Viewpoints panelists for commentary. The Vanier Institute of the Family has released a study showing a dramatic increase in behavioral problems among youth. Why is the big question? Considerable controversy surrounding Stefan Dion's leadership, and it has been reflected in the latest polls. Well, according to one Globe and Mail columnist, Canadians are warming up to private health care delivery. But are we really? Later on, we'll be looking at tips to overcoming the winter blues. But first, let's meet our Viewpoints guests. Paul McKeever is leader of the Freedom Party of Ontario, and Michael Shabcott is senior fellow with the Wellesley Institute. He's also a poverty advocate. Thank you both so much for joining me today. It's great Thank to you. you. Now, the first study that we're looking at here today, now, this is coming out from the Vanier Institute of the Family, and it's showing something pretty alarming here, that one in five kids are showing severe behavior problems. This is not just mild here. This is something relating to intentionally harming others. Now, some reasons are cited in this particular survey here. It's offered up by Anne-Marie Ambert who was the lead author of this particular study. She says that parents are working longer hours for one. Schools and neighborhoods, there's no longer that community spirit or community sort of a way that we once saw. There's also less emphasis, she says, on religion in the home and in society as a whole. And we have a lot of single parent homes. Now, these are the reasons given. But once again, society is always battling back and forth, trying to figure out why is it that we're seeing such dramatic um, well, I don't want to say, well, increases in, in bizarre behavior among our youth. And I'm going to start with you, Michael, on this one. What do you say? Well, I think this is a perennial discussion. I think all yes, parents wonder about what's happening with kids and the, that younger generation. I, I grew up in the 1960s, uh, and uh, certainly uh, uh, the adults of those times were wondering why it was that kids wanted to have long hair and listen to incomprehensible music and uh, uh, do various uh, things, which, of course, I didn't do because I was a good little kid. Oh, never, not but, you. <laughs> but apparently, everybody else was doing it around me. All my all my friends were. So I, I you know, I, I think to a certain extent, I I, I wonder about um, if if you take a a, a long term perspective. The other day, I was looking at a study from Toronto in 1918 that was worried about the number of young people that were coming in front of courts uh, because of uh, uh, petty crimes and so on, and saying that there was a real problem with our youth uh, back in 1918. So I think it's a problem, but. The one thing I liked about this study actually was that what it does do is it says that what kids do has to be seen as part of the broader social context that you can't just say it's bad kids that that uh, you have to look at the what are the social influences that are leading uh, kids to uh, to these kinds of concerns and I think that's very important to ask what's happening in our society are we um, giving kids the nourishment that they need both the physical nourishment but also the social nourishment Do you say that we are I don't think we are I think there's some there's some bad things happening in our society for instance the area I work in in terms of poverty we have a huge amount of uh, poverty one in five kids uh, in Canada are below the low-income cutoff which is the poverty line which means they're not getting proper food they're probably not living in good housing they're probably not thriving in schools because of this so I think those social influences do have a profound effect on kids and I'm not saying all poor kids are bad kids because they aren't That's for sure. uh, but um, but I am saying that those social influences do have an effect on the way kids lead their lives mm -hmm. Paul well I you know I take a different view I the tone of the report seemed to be that if people just spent more time together if we were nicer to one another uh, well, then that would solve the problem of um, children growing up being unnice to other people. But as I see it, uh, the, you know, the uh, cure is almost as bad as, as the disease. Mm -hmm. um, the problem as I see it is that we, t we tell kids essentially nowadays that there is no right, there is no wrong, that we have to tolerate all forms of activity not to judge. And as a result, we end up with things like uh, slogans. 
Um, it's not how you, whether you win or lose, it's uh, how you play the game. Well, that says that there's no value in winning or, or succeeding, that just playing honestly is uh, all you have to do in life. Well, the problem with that is that children grow up uh, playing honestly and then not getting rewarded. They think that if they're just nice with other people, that somehow they'll do well in life, and they won't. They have to learn to value success. They have to learn to take personal responsibility to succeed and to stop making their relationships with others their means for success. Social climbing is not the means to success, and when you think it is, you shave your head, put a tattoo on it, and say, look at me, look at me, in the hopes that people will think mm. you're new and interesting and unique, and that somehow you'll get some kind of benefit uh, by being socially interesting. People need to be uh, willing to teach, uh, teach children that there is right and wrong, and that justice consists in paying for what you get and getting only what you pay for. And children have to learn that if they do work hard, they can succeed and, they, and it, that it's possible in this world. They see all the failures around them because they see people trying to succeed by making people their friends instead of just getting down to the hard work of producing something that people like. And that makes people social right from the get-go. You made some very good points, but you know, Michael also said something that was key too, that throughout the course of time, we tend to generationally have a gap and say, well, look, what's happening to the world? Why are the kids behaving the way they are? Youth is always a time of experimentation. The, the transition from childhood into adulthood has never been easy. We do tend to live in a quite a complex system. If you look at North American society, even if you look historically up to the past maybe five decades, we can still see how we vary from other places in the world where we perhaps are more individualistic, less community support from that point of view. But one thing though, when you look at our generation today, in fact the kids, gen what they're growing up in today, there seems to be more of a one generation gap. It's almost as if with the rise in technology that we've seen, the speed at which we've moved, the world has moved, globalization and so forth, what has happened to the family unit, that we've almost skipped a generation so that parents, they're no longer parenting their children, but it's almost as if they're parenting their grandchildren. And to me this has left somewhat of a, of a void in between where there seems to be such a gap that the kids seem to have little direction, even with the family breakdown of today. Michael, what do you think of this? Well, I, 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 I share a lot of your views, I and mean, I think it's very important to have a collective memory as a, as a society. Uh, you know, I was saying before we went on the air that I woke up at six this morning in order to work with my daughter, who was uh, studying for a philosophy exam on Plato and uh, Aristotle this morning, and. And uh, over the last number of days, as she's been studying for the exam and I've been trying to help her out, I think that there's actually some really rich things uh, from our collective human history that we need to bring forward. But we live in a society where uh, yesterday doesn't exist and the day before never happened. That's a major um, problem. And, and, uh, and I think that it is, it is important to, to, to uh, be critical and to examine things. And I guess I, I would say to, to, to Paul that I, you know, listening to you, I, I think that the way you play the game, there are right and wrong ways to play the game, and it does yes. matter. Yes. How you play the game and and uh, you know I look at um, uh, in the last 10 or 15 years at uh, in in the business world that uh, uh, some of the practices of some of the uh, the corporations that we've seen the Enrons and so on where yeah. where the whole goal of it has been to accumulate yeah. money at uh, mm -hmm. no matter what the cost and, you know, and I think that's wrong yeah mm -hmm. I, I think you're right uh, it's a false dichotomy between succeeding and playing the game it isn't no one or the other it's how you win the game yes should be the answer. It's not how you play the game, it's how you win it. And it's not just whether you win, it's whether you win by acting in, in a moral way on your route to getting there. So true. You can't so separate true. success from the means by which you succeed and when you do so you end up with what we're seeing today. Interesting how Michael mentioned philosophy though because even when you look at the philosophical grounds of moral philosophy we seem to have lost that sort of a dimension in society. Well, and, 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 and nowadays we judge people's value by the size of their iPod, for instance. And, which is, which uh, is pitiful, really. Yeah, and, and, and <laughs> we tend to be an instant gratification yeah. materialistic society at the yeah. risk of sounding really old, but... <laughs> and, and I have to say, I love gadgets as much as everybody else, and, and yes. I think that the, the, these, these things are, are fun, but I think to take that step, which is, uh, you know, what's happened, um, and I don't want to sound like an old fuddy-duddy, uh, like my parents sounded 20 or 40 years ago, but, uh, you know, when you take that step of saying that, that that these things do matter more than just simply having uh, a, a device that can allow you to listen to music when you're walking down the street. If, when, when we begin to uh, confer higher values on, on those things, and, and uh, inevitably we, we lose other values uh, and you know, the, how we relate to each other and the importance of, of our human relationships become very, very important. Things get uh, devalued to the point where the main value we put on things is the dollar value. 
It's interesting. I was listening to moral philosophy on my iPod as I approached the studio. <laughs> well, there you go. So, I, you know, I, I wouldn't say that, uh, that we have to, in any way, undervalue the great things that the mind, the human mind has brought us, technology that allows us to learn about philosophy and to, to know about the moral values as well as the material values. I don't think it's, a, it's an either or. I think it's both. Mm -hmm. I think it's right to, to try and obtain the material values that your happiness and survival depend on, mm -hmm. but that you cannot ever achieve those values mm -hmm. if you don't also have a firm grasp of how you should approach those, those problems of, of obtaining. It's about balance. <laughs> We're going to go for a break now. When we come back, we'll be talking about Stefan Dion's leadership. Lots of controversy there. Stay tuned.